first, if it's cold enough, they'll form a cluster. Queen is in the middle. And then the heater bees vibrate their wing muscles, kind of like a shivering response in humans, to generate heat. Here's a nice thermographic photo of, of a heater bees. Um, and then if any of you opened your hives in the spring and found like a lot of dead bees with their bottoms poking out, these are heater bees. And so the data shows that when we kind of put our bees in situations where they need to go into to, to this heating mode, uh, it's, it's not without a price tag. So um, as you know, I'm here just to talk about the science behind a ventilated hive versus a condensing hive and then introduction to my hive hugger installation system, which it did win the um, American Beekeeping Federation award this year for like best innovation. So a little bit about me, I have been a registered nurse for 35 years. I've been a beekeeper for six. I've worked in the intensive care unit, the emergency room, chemotherapy. I taught doctors and nurses the code blue protocols of when to like push epi, when to defibrillate. So it's actually my years as a nurse that did lay the foundation for how I came to be talking about beehive insulation. Because working in those acute care settings, I have been intimately involved with hundreds of people as they fought for their lives. Maybe it looked like me doing chest compressions on them or giving chemotherapy to a, to a four-year-old. And as a result of those experience, like it has changed me because now in the core of my being, I know how sacred life is and not just human life, all life. And so imagine how I felt that first spring as a new beekeeper in Minnesota when I opened some of my hives and found tens of thousands of dead bees, right? Like I am hardwired to save lives. And so their deaths were on me. I felt gut punched, I cried. Um, and so year after year, I tried different winterization techniques, hoping to improve my survival. These are not my hives, but they sure could have been because I tried many of these techniques. Including straw bales. So much going on here, right? And so what really strikes me most as I look at these photos is we beekeepers will go through great lengths to try to protect our bees in the winter. And we struggle with just how best to do this. And so year after year, despite trying all these different winterization systems, I continue to lose about half of my hives. And I learned I was not alone. According to the University of Minnesota, 50 to 60% colony loss is the average in Northern climates. And I just thought, you know, can't we do better by our bees? And so around this time, I started dating a man who owns a business in high-tech insulation. And so I'm not proud, right? I asked him to build me an insulation system for my beehives because it was a chance to sort of prove his undying love for me. And uh, so he did not, uh, but I think he did something better. He said, Peg, I believe in you. I got your back. Uh, you do it. And so that's how this whole journey began. Um, 
as I mentioned, I was the instructor of the Code Blue protocols, but I was also the instructor and the nurse manager of the intensive care unit, where I would teach nurses how to take care of these extremely complex, critically ill patients. And everything we do in medicine to save lives is based in science. And so as I started this quest to save honeybee lives, it was really important to me that it was also based in science. Being I'm from Minnesota, then my first stop on this endeavor was the University of Minnesota world famous bee lab. And uh, I asked, can you, can you give me advice? Uh, this is my goal. They, they interestingly said, look at the research by Bill Heshbeck. Uh, Bill is a master beekeeper, engineer, author out East. This is an article he wrote in Bee Culture Magazine um, on winter management. But curiously, Bill is kind of the godfather of the condensing hive. And so the university kind of got me on this track, but so I've gotten to know Bill, he's become a mentor of mine. In fact, for two years now, he's used the hive hugger, gives it two thumbs up. But, but besides Bill Heshbeck, um, Etienne Tardif, Derek Mitchell, Tom Seeley, Randy Oliver, and others, um, I did a, a pretty deep dive into the scientific research on overwintering and it's plentiful, it's consistent, it's current, and frankly, these last few years, it's gotten very, very high tech. For example, um, we have access to things like infrared thermal imaging, where we can sort of peek inside of a beehive now and we can see like, where is their heat loss? Where's the cluster? How big is it? Is it moving? So information that, like I said, we didn't have before. And then we've got the whole world of sensors. These happen to be broodminder, but these little green rectangles um, can track the temperature and humidity in your hive every 10 minutes. And you can see it from the comfort of the computer like in your living room. And so specific research I wanna talk about is Etienne Tardif's. And he's, some of you might've heard him speak. He's a brilliant man based in the Yukon. But besides being a beekeeper, he's an engineer, researcher, you know, speaks at Hive Alive and such. But what Etienne does is he'll put up to 20 of these sensors, this is his slide, 20 sensors in a single hive. And then he'll do that for multiple hives and then just change the winterization system. Uh, how it's insulated or not, ventilated or not, changes even the size of the ventilation hole. And then with these sensors and infrared imaging, he just gets literally millions of data points. This is one of Etienne's slides from one of his talks. Um, this is a cross section of a beehive and literally like every inch, he can tell you the temperature and humidity inside your beehive. Here's the ventilation channel. Here's the cluster. Um, so what, what's really important to know is there's, there's really no longer a mystery what's happening inside a beehive thermodynamically. Like the data is there. And as I delved into the, the data and the research, it, it it's became glaringly obvious that besides, you know, winterization issues, cold exposure, moisture issues, there's lots of factors that go into this 55% uh, mortality rate. Clearly, varroa. Diseases. Did you leave enough honey? <laughs> How's your queen? How's your, your hive overall going into winter? So our focus was just on this factor, but we thought, you know, if we could just develop an amazing winterization system that's based in science, that maybe we could put a dent in this 55% uh, mortality rate, it was worth a try. So <laughs> delving into the data, the biggest and most heated debate, excuse my pun that I came across is, which is a bigger cause of winter mortality? Is it wet bees? Is it the moisture? Or is it the cold? And if I surveyed all of you, um, 
I would guess there's about a 50-50 split. And from what I've learned, you would all be right because it's actually both. <laughs> we need to solve for both. And so how to solve for both, I found is best explained by going over kind of a relatable example. And so let's all just say we're going to pile on a bus in January and take a road trip to the Yukon. It's a really long drive. So we have many, many hours to talk about beekeeping. And so as a result, there's just like a lot of hot air in the bus. And then pretty soon the windows start to fog up. Condensation starts collecting. We can't see outside anymore. Bus driver can't see outside the windshield. Side question, what is the temperature of the windows for condensation to be collecting? The answer is dew point. And it's a super important concept to understand um, for later. And so the definition of dew point is basically the temperature where water vapor changes to liquid water. So as we're all sitting here digesting our supper, a byproduct of our metabolism is water vapor. So when that water vapor in the room hits the surface, might be a can of pop, it might be your window, but when it hits a surface in the room cold enough to be at the dew point, the water vapor turns into liquid water and condensation occurs. So what do we do about this condensation so we can see out the windows, right? We ventilate. The bus driver turns on the vent, brings in fresh air, not recycled air. We crack the windows. Pretty soon, condensation clears up. We can see again. But now what's happening? It's getting cold, right? Because as the moisture leaves, what leaves with it? heat. So let's bring this into a beehive. Like humans, a byproduct of bees metabolism is also water. Um, and according to Randy Oliver, for every pound of honey the bees eat, they will produce one, one and a quarter cups of water. And a percentage of that is actually water vapor. So like on the bus, um, if the surfaces in the hive are at dew point, that water vapor is gonna turn into liquid water. And if that liquid water is on top of our bees and is about to drip down on them, right? Wet bees are dead bees. And so what do many beekeepers do about this? They ventilate, right? Um, they cut, holes in the hive boxes. They might put on a quilt box with multiple holes. The inner cover has a hole. But what the research shows happens, like on the bus, in a beehive, when we ventilate, and this is Derek Mitchell's uh, uh, graph, basically shows that in the lower entrance, cold air comes in, it's called like a stacking or a chimney effect that the, old, the cold air comes in and literally gets vented up and out the upper entrance. So certainly, yes, ventilation, moisture leaves, but like I said, what leaves with it? Heat, <laughs> like precious heat. On the bus, right, we have a gas powered engine. So like no problem, we're cold, we can crank the heat. But in a beehive, right, the bees are the engine. And so how do they generate heat? Um, first, if it's cold enough, they'll form a cluster. Queen is in the middle. And then the heater bees vibrate their wing muscles, kind of like a shivering response in humans, to generate heat. Here's a nice thermographic photo of, of a heater bees. Um, and then if any of you opened your hives in the spring and found like a lot of dead bees with their bottoms poking out, these are heater bees. And so the data shows that when we kind of put our bees in situations where they need to go into to, to this heating mode, uh, it's, it's not without a price tag. And Bill Heshbeck 
says in one of his talks, in a non-insulated, ventilated hive, the bees have to put forth an extraordinary amount of effort to keep the colony alive all winter, and they will pay for it by dying earlier in the spring. This chart comes from a research done in Australia. And just to orient you, this axis is, is temperature in Celsius, and this is metabolic output by the bees. Like how hard are they working? <laughs> um, and so this point uh, is, is the temperature in which they said the bees sort of start uh, shivering. They start vibrating their wing muscles to generate heat. And it, it's in the like high 50s Fahrenheit. And so if we go in the cold direction, you can see as, as it gets colder and colder and colder, the metabolic demand placed on our bees exponentially goes up and up versus this side is, is the temperatures where bees aren't needing to do that shivering response, right? They're warm enough. And so the, the metabolic output for bees that are not having to, to shiver to generate heat is significantly different. So really important to sort of remember that what we're doing to our bees when we sort of force them to generate heat. This uh, information comes from Etienne, this data, and basically he says in, in his research that around 50 to 55 degrees, the bees start to cluster. You know, so remember they start vibrating their wing muscles and then they need to cluster at about those temperatures. But at 14 degrees, this cluster is at its tightest. Like it can't get any tighter. It, it, it maxes out at 14 degrees. And so if the cold exposure that's sort of threatening our beehive persists and they can't do anything more about it, this outer layer of bees on the cluster will go into a chill coma and they just start dropping off the cluster until that pattern repeats itself and you just ha have a pile of dead bees at the bottom of your hive. Or some of you might maybe had this happen is the cluster is so tight because it's cold that it can't even move anymore. And sometimes like you'll open up your hive and it's this dead cluster is an inch away from honey. And pe people often say, oh, well, they, they starved to death. You know, they didn't get to their honey. But no, they didn't starve to death. They froze to death because it's cold is the reason they couldn't access their honey because they were too cold to move. What starving to death looks like in the winter is that your bees are still able to move around in the hive, but because they need honey to generate energy for heat, they will simply just consume all the honey you left them until like they've depleted their supplies and there's and then and then they starve to death. And in that setting, people don't really think about that. With this massive amount of honey consumption also comes water consumption because they need water to dilute the honey. And then that makes more waste products. And with limited opportunities for cleansing flights, all those waste products can lead to dysentery and spreading nosema. So again, excuse my pun, but this snowball effect of detrimental effects on the health and well-being of your bees because they're just too cold. And there's more. Um, Derek Mitchell, again, he, he has a PhD, University of Leeds in thermal fluids. And he so he's very intelligent, has written a lot of papers published in the scientific journals. Um, and, and probably the most interesting thing I learned in this research is, this is by, by Derek Mitchell's this quote, the cluster is a survival mechanism we beekeepers impose upon our bees, that in really well insulated hives or in natural colonies, the bees don't cluster at all because they're warm enough. Um, so they're like, Lucy goosey free to ro roam around in the hive. Uh, so remember, like at 50, 55 degrees, they start to cluster. So in these well-insulated hives, these bees are running, the, the entire enclosure can run 60, 65, 70 degrees. So they don't need to cluster. 
Um, and Etienne Tardif down here, he, his research confirms that. In his hives, when he says a well-insulated, non-ventilated hives, the bees resting metabolism is enough to maintain their internal environment. So he's basically saying like, whether it's bees or humans, our resting metabolism just hanging out here, we're generating heat. And the bees heat that's generated just by living life is enough to maintain their internal environment. There's none of this vibrating going on to generate heat. Um, so super, super significant implications um, from this data. Other detrimental effects of ventilating and cold on bees that a lot of beekeepers don't know about, I didn't know about, um, happens in the spring. Uh, say, you know, March, April, May, when it's, you know, starting to warm up, warm enough that the queen starts laying eggs. What happens is these old, tired, and especially tired if they were cold, oops, sorry, but these old, tired winter bees, and, and this graph is by Randy Oliver, where it basically just charts how old there are bees over the different season. Um, and the blue is basically how old are winter bees. And they're pushing sometimes over 200 days old. So in the spring, queen starts laying eggs. These old, tired winter bees now need to activate their glands. And if they were, un if they were clustered, they need to uncluster enough to sort of take care of the baby bees and raise the temperature of the brood to 95 degrees. As you all know that, I mean, that's not negotiable. Um, so in February, there's no, there's no need to have 95 degrees, but, but when there's brood, it absolutely has to be 95 degrees. And suppose you get a, a cold snap in April and the bees like, because of lack of insulation and, and cold exposure, they can't maintain 95 degrees. They will simply quit trying and the brood will die. And without replacement brood, right? Like there's no more bees coming down the line after these old winter bees die. Without replacement brood, your whole colony will perish. So spring is a super common time for beekeepers to lose bees and they're confused about it. And this is why they're like, oh, they made it through minus 20 in February and now it's 20 degrees in, in March or April and they up and died. It's because what's required of the bees once their brood, there's brood present is significantly different um, in spring. So if after this talk you insulate, um, leave, leave your insulation system on till May. There, there's no reason to, to be in a hurry to take it off. In fact, it's a really important time to provide that thermal support for your bees. Uh, the last detrimental effect of ventilating and cold that a lot of people don't know about is risk of life-threatening dehydration. So besides ventilating, getting rid of the moisture, a lot of these like moisture absorbing materials, literally your hive is super dry <laughs> inside there and the bees need water to metabolize honey. Without water, like they can starve. And I, I know beekeepers who've seen their bees make desperate attempts to fly out of the hive to bring back water. So another important thing that a lot of beekeepers don't, don't know about. Um, so the research clearly shows that ventilating, yeah, it gets rid of moisture, but in doing so, it actually hurts our bees gets rid of precious water and leads to life-threatening detrimental cold exposure. And it looks like the bees agree. Um, you know, propolizing up the entrances. This is an apame hive where now that I've in the bee winterization business, I've I've talked to several apame users who who say, ah, oh, yeah, you know, this is a, a common occurrence. Like, and like the bees know. And so ventilating does not solve for both. So the common question asked is, well, if we aren't ventilating, how do we manage moisture in the hive? <clears throat> and the answer is insulate. But in a very specific way, and that's what brings us back to dew point. 
And so the answer is super insulate the top of the hive. And you also insulate the sides, but not as much because if you super insulate the top of the hive, it ensures that the ceiling stays above the dew point, right? If it stays warm enough, say above the dew point, moisture will not condense there. It will condense instead on the cooler walls where, remember, super insulated hive, bees aren't clustering, they're free to roam around. So they will go and, and, and crawl to the side of the hive box and drink the warm water that's being allowed to condense there. Because it will condense because we actually want it to condense. It's a condensing hive because we recognize the importance of water in the hive um, and not losing heat by ventilating. So the key is super insulate the top, um, less on the side, so you have the different differential. This is a research study done by John Gott. He's a master beekeeper out east. And this study was published in 2021 in the American Bee Journal. And it's titled, The Benefits of Providing Good Hive Insulation But No Upper Entrances in winter. And basically what John did is he took some of his hives, he put a plexiglass panel on top of them, top insulated some, and then provided no top insulation for the others. And then sometime into the winter, cracked the lids and took photos. And so the photo on the left is from hives that were top insulated. And you can see very little condensation, but really just on the periphery um, where the bees have access to it versus the hive without top insulation, full of condensation. I'm sure uh, many of you know Randy Oliver. He's a researcher in California. He has really contributed worldwide in, the, in multiple fields in bee research. And this is just a, a clip of his summary of what I just shared. But I thought, you know, if Randy Oliver says it, you probably believe him more than you might believe me. So. Yes, but Randy, you had a, you made the comment that um, how many success might not have value. Yeah. Uh, why would you say that? <laughs> Because looking at all the research, there's very few places in the world where there's been any um, uh, findings that suggest they actually do have it, have a, a value. When you put a top entrance and a bottom entrance in, that's like, imagine you live in a two-story house during winter. Don't, and don't take my word for this. Try this, okay? Is, is, is it cold at your area now? Yes. Okay, so turn off the heater, open the front door, and open the top window, and see how it feels living in that house. What about the moisture content? How's the condensation getting out of the hive? So there's no re first, there's no reason for condensation if the hive is insulated enough. So generally, top insulation will put the condensation to the outside of the hive, to the um, where, where it reaches dew point temperature. That's the moisture the bees need in order to make have enough moisture during the, the winter. Okay. So, insulate. Next question is, well, how much? We know more on the top than the sides, but how much? And in order to sort of quantify insulation, I wanna just define R value because R value is how you sort of measure or quantify insulation. So R stands for resistance. Um, how much resistance does a material uh, have against heat loss? And the R value compares an inch of this against an inch of this. So uh, one inch is, is the measurement in which they sort of compare all these different materials. And so I, I decided to just give a little summary of very common beehive winterization materials and show, share with you what their R values are. Tar paper, people are surprised. It's a zero. <laughs> um, Wood, straw, snow, one to two, 
cardboard, fiberglass, three to four, and foam boards, um, four to five, depending on what kind you get. Many people are like, wow, cardboard's an R three to four, that's amazing. Um, but we have to remember that would be an inch of cardboard, which would be a lot, not just a single ply. So the, the answer, you know, or, or a beginning answer on how much to insulate is, well, it depends where you live. You know, the insulation requirements of bees down here um, is, is very different than up in these climate zones. So I, 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 I tr you know, try to look at to, like, well, what's required? I'm in Minnesota. So what would be required, say, in the northern third of the U.S. and Canada, where, you know, we have pretty, pretty bad winters. And so I, I did, again, look, looked at a lot of the research. Um, this study I actually found uh, was done in Egypt. Um, and they, they compared no insulation with kind of a sackcloth, which I imagine is maybe like a tar paper sort of thing, and then foam boards. And the results of this study basically said that there was a significant increase in hive temperatures, honey, and sealed brood when using foam. Um, and again, right, we talked about the colder the bees are, the more honey they consume to generate heat. Um, and, you know, the queen's capacity to sort of keep the brood warm and more brood um, is also supported by a warm hive. And so the data is very compelling that shows insulation, foam boards really does make a difference. Um, but in this study, I could not find like quantification, like how much foam are we talking? And so it was a really good study to show the effectiveness of foam, foam insulating foam board, but didn't really give us quite enough data. Uh, but then I found another study done University of Illinois. Um, this was just in 2022. And they basically just compared no insulation with foam board, but two inches, so R10 on top and R5 on the sides. And this is the results. Um, the insulated hives had a 22.5% improvement in colony survival. Uh, overall, you know, colonies, like did they die or not die? Which is significant. I mean, that's those are some big numbers. And also interestingly, the insulated hives had twofold reduction in bee decline. And remember Bill Heshbeck saying, you know, if you're, if you're gonna make your bees work hard, they're gonna die sooner. Um, they just will. And this study is like, yep, they do. If they're cold, they'll die sooner. Um, so fewer bees make it. If the hive made it, the hive's weaker coming into spring than what it would have been if it was insulated. And then again, like the Egyptian study, the insulated hives consume significantly less food. So good data. But again, you know, in Minnesota, we're climate zone three, four, but it was good to see that that amount of, you know, R10 and five was significant amount. I mean, it was a great amount of insulation in these climate zones. So I continued to, you know, look at the data. Um, and I came across a research study by Tom Seeley. Um, you, you may know him. He's a PhD professor of biology at Cornell. He's written many books, a lot of scientific journals that he's published in. But what they did is, you know, they asked the question, well, honeybees evolved over millions of years. They come from tropical climates. They've evolved to survive in the winter, um, you know, naturally. So what do bees overwinter and like, what are their homes like when they get to choose where they live? And their research said, well, and it was consistent. They like trees that actually are alive, which is sort of interesting, but very thick solid walls and trees that sort of had this infinite amount of insulation above their enclosure. Remember top insulate, super top insulate. And then bees did not like upper ventilation either. They chose enclosures that just had openings at the bottom. And this is a, a good picture of Bill Heshbeck's 
This is a Langstroth hive box, which is less than an inch of pine. So if we aren't insulating our bees, we are overwintering them with an R value of less than one. And we compare that to a natural hive where, I don't know, is this four, five, six inches? So R, you know, five, six, seven, and then infinite R value on top. So good data. And then Seeley just last year and Radcliffe took the same inquisitive sort of question, but to a whole nother level where they, they did a deep dive into analyzing natural uh, bee cavities and, and wanted numbers like, okay, if, if we beekeepers were to winterize the same that the bees do, um, what what are the R values? Like what it, what would we need to do to to make you know it much closer to the natural home of a honeybee? And and the study conclusions were uh, no upper entrances, R thirty on the ceiling, and R ten on the walls. And I, I don't have a picture, but to get an R thirty on the ceiling, they basically just piled up a bunch of wool blankets and then had like this kind of canvas thing covering it. So now we've got some numbers. And then Etienne, which, you know, I, I've talked about him. He's again in the Yukon where he gets 80 to 100% survival. And he says most of his mortality is actually nosema. He said it's not cold exposure. So that, that, that tells you something. And other beekeepers said, well, he's isolated up there. He does not even, he doesn't get Varroa. That's not true. I, I emailed him saying, you know, is Varroa a problem? He says, absolutely, it's a problem. And so, uh, but anyway, this is this is one of his slides from one of his talks on his hot hive principles. And basically, um, he does not support using upper entrances. R30 on the top and then R10 to 20 on the sidewalls. So similar to the Radcliffe uh, Seeley study, but I just want to point out that he specifically teaches about using a condensing wall on purpose. So we're seeing the theme here, super top insulate, less on the sides, and let the condensation happen in the, in the hive, but on the walls. So based on the review of the literature that I was able to, to come across, um, I, I came up, we came up with an insulation system that is should be good for zones one through five based on the Sealy and Etienne's recommendations. And um, it's called a hive hugger. And so um, I'll kind of go into the details about this specific system, but I did want to just say, you know, I, I know that was a lot of data and a lot of research on overwintering in a condensing hive versus a ventilated hive because a hive hugger obviously is a condensing hive. But as I've started giving talks to beekeeping clubs, I, 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 there's a lot of resistance and confusion because people are accustomed to ventilating. So I know this is a bit of a paradigm shift. And so I wanted to take the time to, to just share the science behind the design <laughs> because the design is intentional. Um, and so instead of like, hey, you know, use the system, it, it, there's a reason for, for the way it was built and, and created. So that's why I want to review all of that with beekeepers. So basically, it's called the hive hugger. There's two components. There's the top insulation, and then there's the side insulation. So the top panel, um, and this is where my partner comes into play, his connections in high-tech insulation. The top panel is made from a vacuum insulation panel. And these are the most effective, highest R value insulation ever made. And they are crazy high. An inch of a vacuum insulation panel is an R46, which is 10 times more efficient than foam board or fiberglass. And, and how does this work? Well, if, if you think about thermoses, the way thermoses work, uh, they're, they're, they're a vacuum. And so in a vacuum, there are no air molecules. So without air molecules, heat transfer cannot take place. 
So vacuums are extremely efficient insulators. And so somebody said, well, why don't I put a vacuum into an insulation panel and make it wicked high efficient insulator? So the top panel um, is made of a vacuum insulation panel. And a little bit more about them. This is from the manufacturer where we have them made. And I already mentioned they're 10 times more efficient than other insulation materials. Uh, refrigerators who have these built in, which probably your fridge does or you hope it does because they use 50% less energy. My partner, actually one of his businesses is shipping um, and it, whether the contents are hot or cold, when insulated with these vacuum insulation panels, the contents will stay at a constant temperature for like five days. Uh, if they are not punctured, again, it is a vacuum, so they can't get punctured, but if they aren't punctured, they have a service life for up to 50 years. Um, they come encased in a, in a puncture resistant covering, and so, you know, like anything sort of valuable, if you take good care of it, um, they will last beyond your lifetime, or maybe not, depending how old you are. And I want to say, if you happen to get a panel and accidentally puncture it, they normally they're super rigid, like in this photo here. If they get punctured and lose that vacuum, they become all bendy, not quite like a pancake bendy, but they become bendable and it's it's very obvious. Um, but because we back up our products and don't believe that that's very likely to happen, our company will replace them for no cost. Because I know it's new technology and people might be a little bit nervous to try something new. So we wanna give you that, that guarantee. So I came across this on the internet. Does the world need an $800 vacuum insulation cooler? Yeti says yes. So if you have one of these fancy coolers, they are putting vacuum insulation panels in them. Uh, but wicked amazing cooler, right? Like that probably is worth $800. Um, so basically these panels are used wherever you want a really high R value, but you don't have a lot of space. And now they've made it to the bee industry. So this is uh, a picture of a vacuum insulation panel on top of the beehive. So what we did um, for the beehive is we had them custom made to be about three quarters of an inch thick, which would be kind of what a moisture board would be just to make sure it fit inside um, with a telescoping cover. And we only really needed an R30, so the panel is an R32. Again, we wanna keep the heavy hitter insulation on the top to keep it above the dew point. Um, but besides that, according to Bill Heschback, 75% of the heat loss is from the top of the hive. So just another super important reason to put the heavy hitter insulation up there. A lot of the winterization systems focus on the wraparound, but don't really address the top insulation, where if you're going to insulate like one place, this would be the place to do it. So obviously it's compact. This is three of the vacuum insulation panels to the equivalent of what it would take in foam boards. So storage, you know, uh, it, it comes in handy. They're mouse and ant proof, eco-friendly, like I said, last 50 years. But I, I do wanna just say that this, um, is, you don't need this to create a condensing hive. In fact, Etienne in, in the Yukon, he stacks, you know, six to seven inches of foam board. He just takes an empty hive box and then just cuts and stacks a bunch of foam board to get his R30. So you can simply do a DIY and then, you know, do one and a half or two inches on the, on the side wrap. So boom, you've got your condensing hive. You know, if you have the access to, to do, doing those things, nothing magical about, you know, this panel. You don't need it to do a condensing hive, but it makes it easier. So that's the top of the hive. The second component, like I mentioned, is just the, the wraparound. And this 
wrap is made just by off the shelf um, foam board that you could get at Home Depot. It's one and a half inches. And uh, we actually have it available in a standard density and a high density. So our value is seven, eight, depending on what density. And then if you add the high box as another, like almost one, we've, we're, we're getting our values of eight, nine on the sidewalls. But what's nice about these panels is we have them professionally water jet cut. It's like a laser, like a water laser. And so the corners fit together like puzzle pieces. They kind of like, you know, they don't snap, but they, they tightly fit together. So it's super easy to put on, easy to take off. You can stack and store them. And then, it, you know, these are both corner guards, so you can tighten down the strap without hurting the foam board. And then this is a, a strap holder. And so the belt and these come with it as well. Uh, so a common question uh, I'm asked is why are you, why are they foil faced? And in fact, they're foil faced on both sides. And that, that design was intentional and it was based on the research. Like, but they're like, well, why not black, right? Black absorbs heat. But the, the data says, I mean, A, if your beehive is dependent on solar gain for heat, I mean, that leaves them very vulnerable at night and they're very vulnerable during cloudy days. Uh, but besides that, the research shows that um, on the sunny day, when the, when the hive heats up, the bees will, will uncluster move around, but then at night they have to recluster, and then they uncluster in the day, cluster at night. And these, these diurnal swings in the hive is stressful for the bees. Um, and that sometimes when they're unclustered, and then it starts, it gets cold really fast, and then they'll cluster, and sometimes they're broke apart, and, and that they can't get back together in a cluster, and then you have these little mini clusters. So what the data shows, and, and I'll explain this. Remember those little green rectangles, those sensors that tell you temperature and humidity? This is the data that comes from those sensors. So to orient you, here's the date, here's the temperature inside the beehive. And each of these squiggly lines is a separate beehive. And so this is the temperature of all of these different beehives. And this pink line is the outside ambient temperature. So here you can see at sometimes it's below zero outside. And so these two top lines are actually hive hugger hives. Um, and as you can see, you know, here's 50, maybe 55, 60s, you know, we're here's 70 degrees. We're running in the 60s to pushing 75 degrees, even when it's below zero versus these hives, the blue and red are tar paper. And you see these big diurnal swings um, day, night, day, night, day, night. And so the research says, just provide super great insulation, right? Because then your bees are just protected no matter how cold it is, no matter if it's day or night. Um, because we really want stable, consistent, thermal uh, protection, which is available with a ton of insulation. <laughs> so that's why. And then the foil on the inside is, you know, being an ER nurse, when patients and uh, come in with hypothermia, we put on these foil blankets. And, and what happens is the foil, the heat loss that's being radiated off a person or a beehive, the foil reflects the heat back at that person or that beehive. So as heat's leaving your hive box, the foil on the inside of the, of the foam panel will, will reflect the heat back into the beehive. Other specific design features um, that go into the hive hugger, it's only available in single deep and double deep. And a lot of beekeepers are used to overwintering in triple deeps, but the, the data says um, that you, if you have too few bees in too big a space that is actually 
it, you can you can have your your bees die from just that alone. These two bullet points are from Etienne, and basically says the amount of bees to the volume of your hive box space is critical. Like it matters because if you have too few bees, too big a volume, winter failure. Um, this research study was done in Egypt and. They basically looked at, you know, the size of the hive boxes and then how did your bees do? And the conclusion of the study said it was observed that the maximum values for hive temperature, honey, pollen, brood were achieved by using the smallest internal beehive size. So, you know, it, it just makes sense. Like, do you want to heat a little tiny bungalow or do you want to heat a three story mansion? So the smaller the space that the bees can manage therm thermodynamically, the better for them. And so the recommendation is, you know, be assessing your bees summer coming into fall and kind of get an idea how big is this, this, um, this, this colony, and then choose the overwintering configuration, a hive box based on number of bees. And remember, a lot of these are summer bees going into fall or they're drones. So the number of bees you're actually going to have over the winter is a percentage of what you think, of what you have right now. So, um, yeah, from what I've learned, there's no reason bees, bees should need to be in a triple D. Um, in fact, Etienne in Yukon, he overwinters. Best success rate is single deeps. We have a beekeeper in Minnesota. He's written a book. He overwinters in nukes, uh, stacked nukes, five frame nukes that are the equivalent of um, a single deep and gets like 100% survival. So another really good thing that came out of the data that I don't think is common knowledge amongst beekeepers. So that, you know, that's really it about the components of the hive hugger. And so I, I wanna just, go over a, a little bit of like, how well, how do you set it up? And it's it's very simple, it should take five minutes. <laughs> but basically, it, this is not a ventilated hive, so plug all entrances, including, you know, the entrance, if you have a notch in your wooden inner cover, trim them so they're flush with the hive because you want the foam board to be resting against the hive box. And again, no moisture absorbing materials. So in some ways, it's just way easier. You don't have to deal with quilt boxes or some people like, oh, I have to change my moisture board continually through the winter because it gets saturated. No moisture absorbing materials. Um, and then you set the lower entrance to the biggest opening because now this is this is your only ventilation. And so the bigger opening, and we we inverted them because if not if, when you're summer bees and you have bee die off during the winter and you have a, a, a collection of dead bees on your bottom board, this way, if, the, if it's inverted, you have some room for bees to collect without plugging up the lower entrance. But if you're a beekeeper who like, wow, well, I check on my bees all winter and I could easily kind of keep the lower entrance clear, then you can certainly have it upright. So, up to you, either one's fine, but the bigger opening. Uh, and then put on your mouse guard. But I, I do wanna pause here a little bit because people who haven't used the system are like, well, what about ice dams? Like, isn't water gonna be just running out of your hive? Should I tilt, tilt them forward? And in our two years of research, A, water doesn't come pouring down the side of the, the walls for, for two reasons. A, um, Warmer air can hold a lot more moisture than cold air. And I don't know if this, this will make a sense to a lot of you, you, but during the day when the warm, uh, the, the air is warm because the sun's out, it can hold a lot of moisture. Then at night, the temperatures drop and you have dew all over your, your yard. It's because the cold air at night can't hold as much moisture as warm air. So again, inside of beehive, Warm air can hold a lot more moisture. So there's just less condensation happening versus in a cold ventilated hive where you have these swings, the amount of moisture, you know, in the day it can hold moisture and then at night it gets cold and it condenses down on the walls. And then at day it, it 
holds more moisture in the night and condenses. So there's way more condensation condensation happening in a cold ventilated hive. That's why you have to ventilate if you're not insulating because you will have crazy amount of moisture condensing. But in a well insulated hive, there's not as much condensation as you'd think. And remember the bees eat um, 30 to 50% less honey when they're warm. And how does the moisture even get in the hive in the first place? The bees right? They're the source for the moisture. And so you're, you're like 50% less honey conception. You have 50% less moisture even being generated in the hive. So yes, it, it's the opposite of what you think. A condensing hive actually has less moisture generated than a non-condensing hive. So no ice dams. We had like no mold issues. So yeah, if some of you were wondering that, that that's, that's the explanation. So then um, back to the setup guide, sorry, I, I digressed a little bit. Um, so this is the top of the hive. So you've got your hive box, keep your, your wooden inner cover in place uh, and then uh, put this, and this comes with a kit. It's just a little piece of reflectix insulation. Cover that hole in your wooden inner cover because we want the bees to stay down into the hive because on top of your wooden inner cover will go the crown panel, um, the, the vacuum insulation panel. And as you can see, it's cut to, to fit exactly over the wooden inner cover. And then we recommend taping around this um, A to tape in case you're, you have a hole in your wooden inner cover to, to seal that. But a lot of times, you know, people's woodenware is warped or chipped or damaged. We want a really nice seal here because we want the top of the hive to stay warm. So the kits come with a little sample roll of Tyvek so you can tape around the top of your box. Um, and then the foam boards, like I said, just snap together. You can put the whole thing, if it's a little bit loose, you know, slip it over your hive box and then tighten it down with a strap. Do it so that the strap, you know, uh, enclosure, the closure is, uh, the buckles behind the hive so you're not in the way of the bees. Um, but that's it. And then put the, obviously the telescoping cover back on. And so pretty simple setup. Uh, shouldn't again take more than a few minutes to, to do. And so the, that's the nuts and bolts of the, the system itself. And then next I wanna share um, the data we did on the system and a little bit about the history about it. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I started this whole quest by going to the University of Minnesota. And once I got the first prototype built, I went back to them. I said, well, you know, this is what I came up with, I, you know, after doing a, a ton of research and, and product development. And, and so I, I spoke to their bee club and Marla Spivak sitting next to me, Gary Reuters across the table, like uh, kind of nervous, um, but basically said, this is, this is what I've got. And, and so um, they said, well, you know, get the data, right? We're scientists. And, and I just want to mention, like, if some of you know, the University of Minnesota recommendations for overwintering, they, they, they teach ventilated hives black tar paper, not insulated and, and ventilated. And so, you know, that was a little bit of an awkward conversation, but Marla said, you know, Peggy, what kind of scientists would we be if we weren't like embracing new ideas and new data? And so she said, you know, study it. So the first year uh, with the prototype, I had 10 hive hugger hives and I actually ventilated them. Uh, because I, I wanted to get some comparatives. So this is the University of Minnesota hives. There's me. I had a little bee door. So th there's an opening. This is like a wind block, but the, they were ventilated and then Nature's Nectar had some. And basically the hive hugger hives that were ventilated only had about a 50% survival. So it really told me that despite the heavy hitter insulation, that heat kept in and generated with bees was just getting that chimney effect was just full on. And Etienne, and I told you he has a lot of different testing with configurations, he tried his 
heavy hitter insulation with upper entrances. He said it was disastrous. So clearly, um, yeah, ventilating's not good. And then um, 10 hive hunger hives were not ventilated and they had over 90% survival. Um, and then of those 10, this was my first introduction to Broodminder. So of the 10 that were not ventilated, actually two of them I sent out to, I have a beekeeper friend in Wisconsin who does cutouts. And th these are his hives. And uh, so again, the top two are, are hive hugger hives. And these other color lines are just the rest of his hives. And this beekeeper, curiously, he knows about condensing hives, but he puts... Uh, two inches on the top and one inch on the side. So he has an R10 and, a, and an R5. Uh, and he does not ventilate. But come January, he called me and he said, Peg, you need to look at my broodminder data. The hive hugger hives are running 20 to 35 degrees warmer. Um, and the thing that was really significant, he said in the spring, cause he weighs his hives in the fall and the spring, he says, these hives had 50% less honey consumption. He said, opening the, the hive in the spring, he said it was like a sauna, this hot air came rushing out. But if you think about it, if they're running, again, look at high 60, 70 degrees, they're not vibrating their wing muscles, right? I mean, here's his, they, they are insulated, but he's dipping down into the below the 50s. They, they're clustering. Um, so the, the 30, you know, the, the data that said, no, you need an R30 from Sealy, it's because you need an R30, at least in Minnesota winters, that even here, you know, it's zero degrees. An R30 will keep them in this, hey, we're not clustering, we're doing good range, that's where the numbers come into play. So that was important data. And based on that data, the University of Minnesota said, uh, cause I had done the little pilot study the first year and got some good data, they said, get more. <laughs> so they told me about this SARE grant um, and we're kind enough, they wrote a letter of recommendation we got the grant. Uh, I had a partner because I don't, you know, I don't have 80 hives. So the original SARE grant was 80 hives. We were, and this is a picture of it: tar paper, bee cozy, reflectix, hive hugger, and they're all. This is a broodminder solar hub. They're all instrumented with broodminder sensors. But my my partner um, got COVID, and then there were some other issues that came up that we, we were unable to complete the study. And the only data that I was able to get uh, were on the hive hugger hives. And I, and I, I know that of the 20, we had over 90% survival. And I do have some broodminder data on them. Um, so this you saw earlier, this is just a little bigger clip of it, the hive hugger hives versus the um, tar paper bee cozy hives. And here you can see in, in December, we're well below zero. Um, and again, the hive hugger hives maintain pretty darn well. Uh, so that's the data. Um, because I didn't get to finish. Oh, sorry, let me back up a little bit. Besides the kind of scientific controlled study data, last year I had this group I call the all comers because there were about 30 people who I just said, hey, try them out. Uh, this guy, you know, used, used bee cozies. Um, but there's 30, 30 hives out there with hive hugger. I have no idea how they manage their hives. How much honey did they leave? Did, how were their mite counts? I have no idea. But of the 30 hives, the ones that were winterized with hive hugger had about a 28% colony loss. But if we remember the average in Northern climates is about 55. So one can deduce that winter loss was potentially decreased by 25% by insulating with hive hugger. 
Um, and in fact, the beekeepers who did lose their hives with the hive hugger said, yeah, you know, I don't know what the my counts were. I think I maybe got robbed in the spring or I put your system on my wheat colony, hoping it would make it. But, you know, the, the hope or the dream that the, a really good inter winterization system could put a dent in that seemed hopeful. Because remember that other study that reduced mortality by 22.5%. I believe that this that this is probably pretty accurate. Um, so, uh, oh, a few testimonials from beekeepers. This guy, beekeeper five years, he never had a more robust spring inspection than he did after using hive hugger. He said the colony looked like it was August in the spring, full of honey and brood. Um, you know, this guy did the, he's the one who did the hive hugger with the bee cozy, much number of surviving bees way ahead in spring buildup. Uh, yeah, to, to overwinter and open your hives and have surplus honey is surprising to beekeepers, but that's not an uncommon finding. So, um, so back to the research this coming winter, I, because of the SARE grant not getting completed, the money and a lot of the equipment is going back into research this winter. Instead of one beekeeper, we're splitting it between five different apiaries, apiaries including the University of Minnesota. And so that'll be good. What will, I mean, I, I clearly have a solid foundation and have a, a really good footing on the effectiveness, but, you know, more data is, data is king, right? Data is everything. And so besides the, the 65 hives, we will have 150 all comers uh, out in the field. I, I have 150 just random beekeepers have the system who agreed to give me their email address so I can follow up with them in the spring and get, so these will be controlled for variables, you know, really tight where these are again, the all comers. So this coming winter, even more data. So yeah, the big takeaways is from my research, the review of the literature, the scientific data out there, it appears that a very well insulated condensing winter setup is a significant factor in ensuring overwintering success. Decreased mortality, stronger spring colonies, queen starts laying earlier, less honey consumption, and they have access to much needed water. So oh, I keep adding to this because people ask a lot of different questions. And so I'm like, ah, I was gonna put it in the presentation. So obviously, yes, um, do your best to manage mites and diseases because a healthy hive really um, is a huge factor going into winter. The best insulation in the world won't prevent your bees if they're really sick or, or, or varroa infested. It'll prevent against cold exposure. Um, it'll, it'll make your bees stronger getting through the winter and stronger immune systems and, and better ability to fight off varroa and diseases, but it won't prevent that winter kill um, in some, some cases if it's bad enough. So also uh, people ask, well, when should we start winterizing? When should we start putting our systems on the hives? And according to the uh, the research, remember 50s, 60s, they're vibrating their wing muscles and they're already working harder. They're clustering to generate heat. Granted, it's not what it's going to be when it's minus 20, but why stress them? You know, even if you are going to do, you know, treatments later away or something after there's no brood, just take it, take it off and put it back on. Um, so that's the recommendation. Bill Heshbeck says, if you need to put on a jacket to go outside, then you should have been insulating your bees by then. Uh, do not set your hive boxes on cement or concrete. Uh, the hive will lose heat through contact with those materials or metal, obviously. Um, in Minnesota, we recommend uh, providing 80 to 100 pounds of honey for a double deep and 60 to 80 for a single deep. Uh, but I, I can tell you they will not eat, they won't need that much, but honey provides thermal mass. It's a great insulator. It holds heat. And so, you know, it's better to not skimp and, and uh, don't, don't try not to leave like just empty frames in the hive box. 
So that's our recommendation. Be mindful of late feeding. The honey needs time to cure. And then to encourage spring um, buildup, uh, a pollen patty in spring after the first cleansing flight. So, all right, I think that is it. Yes, so these are some of the references. No, I think they're pretty comprehensive on, on what I've used. Uh, so I'm happy to share these. Oh, it's being recorded, so you have it, access to them anyways. And so I, I wanna just close and thank you all for coming. Um, I am still nursing. I, uh, I'm i gonna be 59 next week. And I, I kind of thought maybe I'd be transitioning out of nursing and retire in a few years. Not exactly sure what I'm doing starting a business at my age, but I, I feel like I, I'm supposed to, if that makes sense. And that maybe I'm supposed to transition out of saving human lives and focus on saving honeybee lives. But I've loved it. I love research. I love beekeepers. I've I've had I've never had so much fun as I have in this endeavor. Uh, but I also want to share that that young boy that you saw who was my chemotherapy patient. He had metastatic liver cancer when I met him, and he is still around. Uh, he's doing well. He completely beat the odds. A bit of a miracle. And so with that, I just want to leave the message that I started with, that life is precious. And take good care of yourself, take care of your loved ones, um, and take care of the bees and all living things. So if you want more information about the product, our website's hivehugger.com. I'm super, super open to answer questions if you want to email or, or I think I don't know if my phone number is on the website, but yeah, feel free to reach out. So with that, um, yeah, I, I'm open for answering questions if we have time. I don't know how much time yeah, your club so had. Very, very good, Peg. Peg, I appreciate it. Um, it was very well done. And um, we do definitely have some questions lined up if you want to spend a little more time with us to answer some of those. Sure. Uh, I do have one comment. Uh, well, I have lots of comments. That's uh, kind of my thing is always having comments, unfortunately. Um, but uh, that, I'm a social worker, so we've always got something to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I I think that there there's a really great attention to detail in what you, not just your presentation, but <clears throat> the hive hugger. I, I think that really kind of gives it um uh, a bit of an extra appeal because it definitely shows the care that you've communicated to us tonight during your presentation. So I appreciate that. It, it definitely makes me interested in it, especially being a proponent of insulating the colony and using smaller cavities is something that I do, just like Adrian Quiney, whom you had mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and, and before we pour into the uh, into the questions. I have a video here, uh, a lot more social workers in the audience. Um, I have a video here from, so I'm going to stop your screen share. Okay. It's from John, uh, John Gout. It's his water bottle bee video. And I, I really, I think this kind of helps seal the deal with the idea of condensation and ventilation. Um, is that it gives you a different perspective of what the bees are doing with the moisture in the colony. So let me see if I can remember how to do this. Um, share. Uh, optimize. John sent me that same video. <laughs> yeah, it's a great video. I've had yeah, it for quite it a while. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Okay, it's coming. Here we go. Should play now. Everybody see this, I hope. Um, and this is so these are bees near the edges of one of the plexiglass covers this bees drinking some of the condensate from the edge of this hive which is probably a water bottle bee um, these bees will store the water um, and use it as needed in the cluster probably mostly to thin the honey so it can be uh, consumed by the other bees Perfectly dry around the center. This is from a clear inner cover without a vent. Um, two temperature sensors in here. One's measuring both the temperature and the humidity, and the other's just the temperature. 
So that right there, I think, is pretty convincing that you don't have to worry too terribly much about the condensate that's on the perimeter. And if anything, it's giving a lot of um, extra benefit to the colony, both from a nutrient and as well as an insulation aspect. So, all right. So questions. Let's see here. They're pouring in. I'm going to try my best. Do, do, do. Okay. So Tina says she's read that bees use the least amount of energy at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. If we keep the internal temperature at 70 degrees, are the bees using more honey than they would at 40? Give any thoughts to that? Because it's warmer in the colony, are they going to be using up more honey? Um, you know, I, I don't know where the data of the that they use less at 40. Um, I'm not familiar with that data. So I guess if, if she could share where she read that at 40, they use less. That hasn't been consistent with what I found. So I guess I can't speak to that. Um, the data that I've seen is that, uh, no, when they start having to cluster, so at 40 degrees, they're clustering and vibrating their wing muscles. Um, and that with that response is equated with more honey consumption. So I guess I, I can't say that I can answer that um, because it's it's not what I had learned. Yeah, and that kind of dovetails back into another question that she added. How does that affect the bees' flights in winter? Um, if it's 70 degrees in there, do they know when they can fly safely? So, you know, I can, can speak to that just a little bit. Uh, and, you know, I, it may be a Michigan thing, but I get bees that will fly at 30 degrees and 35 degrees. And some of them coming back, not just flying to die, which because which is primarily what they're going to be doing around that time of the year anyways, um, is leaving the colony to go uh, expire. Or they're out maybe foraging for water because they need to bring more back because it's too dry in the colony. Um, mm -hmm. But usually what I've observed is that they don't fly any more than usual in the insulated setups. Um, it, you know, from my own, uh, you know, desire to answer that question in the research that I've looked at, they're responding more to the temperature plus the photo period. So the bees are going to kind of engage in foraging type activities and brooding activities <clears throat> that cause that exiting of the colony to go do those sort of things to provide support to the rest of the hive. Um, based on the, the longevity in the day of the daylight, as well as the temperature combined together. So if you, if you have warmer temperatures, but the days are still short, their activity is still going to be pretty limited. Yeah. And if we think about again, in a tree cavity where they naturally, it's a lot hotter. they know when it's time to come out, right? Like, yeah, <clears throat> and we haven't, we, that wasn't an issue in our, our research hives as well that they like, oh, it's hot in here. It must be hot out there and then fly out and, and die. But no, they, they they know what's going on. <laughs> this question is from Suzanne. So kind of, a, I think this one's one that beekeepers would probably debate based on preference. So solid bottom board or screened. And if the bottom entrance is wide open, mouse protected. Yeah, so first um, in our, our research, we used a combination of screened and solid bottom boards. If they were screened bottom boards, obviously the, the panel slid in, but it didn't seem to make a difference there. I think like thermodynamically, if you think about, I mean, the, the example I, I, I use is in cub foods. If you see the freezers and they don't have a lid on them, you're like, how is the food staying frozen? It's because, you know, cold drops and heat rises. So whether it's a solid or a screen bottom board, the cold's just going to drop at the bottom of the hive. Um, so the, the, it's it's not a big factor as far as sort of heat loss. Um, having a screened or a solid bottom board, it, it, it didn't seem to make a difference. Mm. So. Um, in the condensing hive, do you know of any research that's being done that looks at the possibility of carbon dioxide buildup in the hive and any associated impact to the wintering bees? So I've read studies and I've heard from other beekeepers that there are cultures or, or, or 
parts of the world that will actually bury their hives intentionally in snow as an insulator. And so what happens is because there is heat leaving the lower entrance that that sort of melts the snow. So there's a little igloo or a little dome for some air exchange, but that overall the CO2 is allowed to build up in those hives. And that there is a point where the metabolic rate of the bees does slow down because of CO2 levels creeping up. Hmm. But I we personally didn't study this, but oh, um, is it, so is John got on our call? Bees yeah, he's, he's been here for the whole time. Oh. Yep. <laughs> um, so yes, clearly there's people probably who can speak more than me. And 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 so my understanding is, yes, that they, they can tolerate high levels of CO2 um, and that can slow down their metabolic rate, mm -hmm. but way over my head. So. Well, you did a good job attempting it. So, okay. <laughs> But <laughs> I'm... I am super open since there's tons of like really experienced, smart people on the call. If people want to weigh in, my ego is is certainly fine to to have other people share their knowledge of this. Well, we brought you on because you made it understandable, right? Yeah. Oh, well, okay. That's fair. That's fair. Oh, right. well, yeah. Because sometimes the research is so hard to decipher that it, it people get lost. And that that was my goal is to condense it down in a way that's you know, absorbable and understandable. So, so this one's a high fucker question. Um, and so I'll have you answer it. Can the high fucker, can they be cut or will they fit? Is there a way that they could fit a three medium hive setup, three medium boxes? Well, so I've <clears throat> three mediums are about six inches and the double deeps just um, over 18. So the double deep, is pretty darn close to three medium. So I've had people purchase the double deep and use it on a medium. There might be, you know, a half inch or an inch that you may need to prop it up a little bit, but it's, it can work. Yeah. 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 So that's what I, I would, I would go with on the three mediums is for a double deep. It's very, very similar. There's a couple inch difference, but it, it will cover most of the surface. Uh, Happy birthday, Peg. Happy B Day coming Aww. up. <laughs> that was nice. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, somebody said, will this work for <clears throat> for nucleus colonies? Um, I run five frame medium nukes, four and five boxes tall. <clears throat> Well, it should. Um, I actually have, and not that I want to put this out there too much, there are a couple of beekeepers that reached out who who have a similar uh, stacked to, you know, double deep, five frame. We are custom building a, a wrap for them. Um, but basically, if you, if you just buy the double deep, you can cut out a panel and then, you know, we use that venture clad aluminum cladding to, to you know, repair that cut. But there's been enough demand that I think by next winter, we will offer a, a, a double deep ra a wrap for, for stack nukes. But I, if people have any advice for this, when I research, because we do sell a, a, a crown panel, the, VI, the vacuum insulation panel for nukes, but we just don't have the wrap, because I found that there is not a standard size for nuke boxes. And so coming up with a crown panel, I kind of like, well, there's five different sizes out there. I, I kind of shot for the middle. So if people, like, well, what what size wrap then, I think was maybe one barrier to making a wrap because the nuke hmm. boxes aren't consistent. Well, you know, the nuke top, the crown board, and then, you know, obviously Adrian's system, you know, which is replicating a lot of other folks with the insulation on the sides and the nukes pushed together, and plus the hive, plus the 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 uh, the protectors, the tie protectors to keep the corners from cinching down, that would be fantastic, right? Because then you've got that if you're using it in that manner versus <clears throat> you know sizing it per each. That's how I would use it because I bring my nuke boxes together yeah. also, yeah. and then insulate the sides and the tops. Um, yeah. We actually are doing a custom build for a woman who has uh, 10 stacked nukes. So it's a five 
you know, five doubles and five doubles. And we are doing a custom wrap for her group nukes, you know, like Adrian. So Adrian doesn't, because he has those little wood handles on their fronts and back. So he can't put insulation on the front and back. That's why he only does the side panels. Um, but anyway, she doesn't have the wooden handles and wanted the full wrap around. So we're a small enough business. The warehouse guy is a carpenter. He's happy to do customs. So as long as we have time. Right. Well, um <clears throat> So yes, I, I agree. Thermodynamically, having the nukes sharing heat, the wall heat would be a better setup than doing each one individually. So yes, at this point we are we're doing we're doing that. Andy Dixon would love your thoughts on the idea of removing the inner cover for winter, and instead using a full size sheet of Reflectex, and then put that your vacuum or your crown board or insulation above that, which would help ensure a better seal against the uneven wooden surfaces of like an inner cover or the, the issue with the, the, the notch being taped over. You know, I think, so the cutout guy in Wisconsin who has used my system with the broodminder data, he only uses Reflectix for inner covers. And that's what he does with, with the system that I've been giving him. He, he that's exactly what he does. Um, for sure, I guess, you know, what's the reason? People kind of like, they don't want to have to store their wooden inner covers. Maybe they want to slip a pollen patty in there and they want that little bee space. Um, I think that's fabulous. I guess um, you, you probably, would you still need to tape around it? Maybe a good idea, but probably more of a seal with, like you said, warped or damaged woodenware. Maybe next year we will we will use that instead because I actually think that's a good solution. Yeah. There's a lot of variables, especially and this kind of leads into the next question. Like if you have to break into them, say, you know, for us Northern beekeepers in late December or January or February, and you want to add emergency feed, you'll end up breaking a seal with that top cover. And you may need to come back and maybe retape that if you want to keep that, you know, from creating a ventilation aspect. So how, how, and Paula says, thanks for the informative talk. Are you putting emergency feed on the hive and what type of system do you use if you do? None, zero. Yeah. You, you just don't need it. I mean, I know people like, oh, that's a big ask to trust, but um, yeah, I mean, the data, they, they just eat way less honey. So if you leave 80 to hundred, there's no need for emergency feed. Right. It's been our experience. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, with the installation method, I'm actually fighting swarms way earlier than I hope to, because oh. <laughs> there's you know there's no room in there. They they brood up faster. They uh, do. So many bees in February that they're just pouring out, <clears throat> and the second that they're able, they're trying to get out of there. Yeah, yeah. I mean it's so a that's good one problem. downside. It's a good problem to have, but that's it's right, right. That's stressful. Right. Right, exactly. Tra trading one stress for another. So, <laughs> right. Uh, I've also found that bees in insulated colonies consume half of what in uninsulated colonies consume over the broodless period. That's from Wayne Hughes. So, uh, yeah, sh stratification because of air density. So, let's see here. Lots of comments. So, is a screen bottom board okay over winter? Yeah, as long as you put the panel in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think Bill Heshbeck uses a combo of screened and solid, and yeah, it, and in our research, it, it didn't seem to matter either. Peg, are you pursuing your master beekeeping certification? I mean, if you retire, you'll have time. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I haven't even thought about it. I, I should. I should. Um, I, I'm so busy. I actually have two nursing jobs. I have my aging parents and I've got this startup business. So the, right now, maybe once this falls done and, and the bee sales drop off, I'll have a little bit more breathing room. But that's a great idea. I, I really should because I, I do love it. My heart's I've never been happier than delving into the whole bee world. So why not? I work with a lot of nurses because I work in the hospital systems and, and 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 it's funny because they'll say, well, I'm retired. I'm like, no, you're not. You're here working, right? Like just nurses <laughs> never retire. <laughs> yeah, that's true. So we'll see. But thank you for the suggestion. I'll, I'll think about that. Yeah. Are yeah. hive parkers available for eight frame hive boxes? 
They are. Um, I we don't have a lot of inventory left in a frame. I didn't. I had no idea how many to sort of do this first season. So we do, but we don't have a lot. And I, I do have um, some more on order, but I don't know when they'll get here. But I for for right now, yes, we do. John did chime in. He said he likes to leave his inner cover on. Um, oh, I want to back up with the A-frame only in the oh, double sorry. deep. We don't have A-frame in single deep right now. It's only in the in the double deep. Okay. Okay. I like to leave the inner cover on. The bees use the space under the inner cover to move around in the top box. Mm -hmm. And I like I liked having uh, the flat piece of plastic. Like I use an old shower curtain. But my mm -hmm. wife will toss out the the, the shower liner and it, it's a clear plastic. So I would cut those up and place those over the top. And so, you know, plexi is expensive and it kind of served a similar purpose, mostly to keep them from chewing on the foam board. Um, but it also let me peek in on them because I have nothing else to do in the winter when it comes to the bee. So I want to check <laughs> in on them. Uh, are you OK? Are you OK? Um, so that's a great idea. Do you use, so you do like the shower curtain and then foam board? Not, right, no. yeah. So the shower curtain, the the line, inner liner of a shower curtain, and even the vinyl ones, if they're not clear, it's fine. I, you just can't see through those ones. And, okay. you know, I'm repurposing something that's normally just going to clog up the landfill. And for me, I was like, I hate to throw it out, but there's mm -hmm. not a lot of other uses for it around the house, especially if it got moldy somehow. My wife definitely doesn't want it in the house. Right, okay. So, um. Uh, Nancy says she's so happy for the billions of happy warm bees that will benefit from your hive hugger. Thanks for all the info. Thanks for the cohesive research and presentation. Yes, very much so. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, SBGMI. I love you, Peg from PA. Good winter, everyone. Uh, oh, PA from PA, Pennsylvania. Oh, <laughs> from <very> Papa. <laughs> uh, somebody's mentioning entrance reducers you know some folks use uh, partial entrance reducers with their condensing type setups or insulated setups but some only use a partial reducer and then like you showed in your pictures just the the mesh um, hardware cloth is that what you guys were using there and yeah, right right and yeah, what yeah. size is that hardware cloth you were using uh i don't know Half inches, usually what we use. Uh, that sounds right. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, fantastic. Any that that about catches all the questions up. Um, okay. Well, that wasn't too bad. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, we we are very grateful for the opportunity for you to come and and share uh, your system with us and the compilation of information that you put together. Uh, we did, you and I did discuss previously that you were willing to extend a discount for SBGMI members. Is that correct? Yeah, for sure. Um, so if on the website, when you order at the bottom, it says, how did you hear about us? If you could just put, you know, Michigan, you know, Michigan, or just, yeah, what, just so you let me know that. You what we'll do is we'll put a discount code in the member section. And oh. they, can, they can put that discount code in that memo to you. So that way you can verify membership. Perfect. And it'll be okay. very easy to, 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 to track. That's and a we, good we're, idea. We're, yeah. And we we're 100% behind you because we think this is a great idea. We see the survival rates go up. We want people to be more successful with their beekeeping. Yeah. Well, that's so great. I'm, I'm glad, you know, that, you you already sort of were on board and that I'm just sharing it and and not really teaching anything all too new. But yeah, I think there is a paradigm shift happening and the condensing hive concept is is catching on. You know, my goal really is is education. The 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 B sales of the product is secondary. I think it's nice to have something that is is easy to use. But that's really, if I die, you know, the thing I'll be most proud of is is the education. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so not, not if I die, when I die, that that's really what I want to um, have the the most impact is this the the te the teaching part. 
So yeah. John says excellent presentation. He has his high fogger on and it looks good. <laughs> they look nice too. There is yeah. a person, a beekeeper at the American Beekeeping Federation who who does like the the world's who's who, the rich and famous, who he cares for their bees. They want bees, but they don't want to care for them. And he said they'll just love this, not because it's effective, because it looks good. <laughs> Instead of pink foam boards, they'll have this nice looking system. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, my my yard my yard looks disastrous in the winter. <laughs> <You're full laughs> everywhere, and, uh, but they're warm, so it doesn't if, matter. If that matters to you, so. yeah. Well, it looks like you got a couple orders that poured in, and uh, oh. a couple of folks before we said to use the the code. I'll get that code up tomorrow, so um, we'll make sure that everybody gets that information uh, in an email. We'll send out an email to the membership. And uh, a, a couple orders came through tonight. They said they put SBGMI in there. So make sure okay. you check on them, Peg. Um, and again, it was a pleasure having you and glad to glad to listen in on your talk. And we'll be talking soon. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you, You're everybody, welcome. for attending. It was really an honor. All Appreciate right. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.